Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be invited here today um, by the uh, UCSD Center on Global Equity and Health. It's an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to give actually the first presentation, and then our next presenters will be Janine Schooley from uh, 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 Project Concern International at Nadolo Prata from the UC Berkeley Bixby Center and Jesse Clyde from IPPF. And I'd like to um, say that I, as I said, I work for Women Care Global. It's a UK-based charity, but our headquarters are here in San Diego. Before that, I worked for IPASS, and I'm still doing research in Nepal for IPASS or with IPASS. I've done a lot of work with ANSWER, UCSF. Um, currently, the Center on Global, Health, Global Equity and Health is doing a formal evaluation of our project in Kenya and South Africa, which I'm going to discuss. When Mifepristone was approved, I worked for PPFA uh, to get medical abortion out in use in the United States. And I worked with Planned Parenthood of the Pacific Southwest for 15 years. So I say that by way of acknowledging that I have a lot of family here. Um, so reproductive rights and access is an area that I've spent my entire adult life working on. And I, like you, I feel so honored and blessed to wake up every morning with a sense of purpose that I, my work can make a difference in the world, and it can make a difference not only today, but tomorrow and for future generations. The ability of a woman to control her fertility and decide when and how many children she has is a, a basic human right. And without access to highly effective contraception, safe abortion, and safe delivery, millions of women die and will die of pregnancy-related causes. And the death of a woman and a mother perpetuates the cycle of, of death and poverty, as you know. A child whose mother dies during childbirth is three to 10 times more likely to die before his or her second birthday. Spacing births at least two years apart significantly reduces the risk that a woman will die during pregnancy. Globally, one, to five, one in five girls give birth before they turn 18 years old. The probability that a 15-year-old girl will die eventually from a pregnancy-related cause is one in 25,000 in Singapore, similar numbers in Northern Europe, whereas in Chad and similarly in some other African countries and countries where there's been poverty and, um, and war and crumbling of government infrastructure, the chance that a 15-year-old will die in her lifetime of a pregnancy-related cause is one in 15. So in what world is it just that a human being is born, born a female, born in a country where she is so likely to die of, of a pregnancy? That that's not just, and that's what we're all working to prevent and to change the whole, the, the paradigm. Um, and as you know, many, many countries in the world are working to achieve Millennium, to goal, millennium, to goal, millennium Development Goal 5, which is to reduce maternal mortality by 75% by the year 2015. And as you know, few countries are on track to achieve that goal. But we also need to look beyond 2015 to really examine and reflect on what has worked what hasn't worked, and, and why and why not. Um, I've been to India where decisions were made that all women should, should be encouraged to deliver in facilities. The reality of it is that not all women do deliver in facilities, and even if they arrive to the parking lot, that's counted as a facility birth. In, in Cambodia, um, there's been a, an effort to reduce maternal mortality. And I met with a group of doctors there when I was there doing training, working on this project. And they told me that a vaginal delivery is very, very inexpensive. The poorest of the poor can afford a vaginal delivery. And I said, what if a very poor woman 
needs a C-section to save her life. And they looked at each other, and you could tell they were trying to figure out what version to tell me. And they finally told me the truth. She will probably die. So that's you know a huge gap in an effort to reduce maternal mortality. In Nepal, as you probably know, in Nepal, many women, it's a very mountainous country, many women live in villages two days walk up a path. There's no road, they have to walk two days down to the nearest road. So they decided to build maternity houses or shelters connected to clinics so women could come there, wait to go into labor and deliver in the maternity houses. And I asked when I was there, and how is that going? And again, they looked at each other thinking, wonder what we should tell her, and they told me, they're warehouses, they're warehouses. I mean, women two days up the path are not going to walk two days away from their family, not knowing when they're going to go into labor and, and sit there till they go into labor, ignoring their, their family, their children, their mothers, their aging parents, it, they're, they're warehouses. Um, in Ethiopia, they've, they have decided not to go down the route of working on all facility-based deliveries, and they've hired health extension workers who have a certain level of education um, and are trained in certain modules, one of which is clean and safe delivery. So these young women are, are living in the village environments and are taught to recognize what a normal delivery is, how to conduct a safe and clean delivery, and how to call back up for help. Um, and Eritrea is one of, the, one of the few countries on track to reach, to reach MDG5. And they also have trained local language uh, traditional birth attendants to improve their skills and prepare them to manage safe deliveries and to recognize pro problematic um, events in labor that should prompt their call to backup. Only half of women in Africa have access to skilled birth attendants. So, and by the way, the United States is 47th in the world in, from the top in, in maternal mortality ratio. So even though a lot of my focus has been on the developing world, I do read the New York Times every day, and I don't see a big impetus in the United States to improve our maternal, maternal mortality ratio. So. I mean, we don't have bragging rights is the basic message there. Um, so as you know, 87% of the world's youth are concentrated in developing countries. And from my work in Africa and my, my look into the demographics of Africa, I see that I, I believe Africa has the potential to be the economic powerhouse of the world in the next 20 years. Um, because of their huge, huge youth demographic. The average age of the population in Tanzania is 17 years old. The average age in Kenya is 25 years old. So if this huge youth demographic can be trained and educated to reach their potential and contribute to society, you can see that, that Africa could just be a powerhouse. Whereas Japan, the average age of the population is 46 years old. Italy, it's 44 years old. I mean, there are not going to be replacement workers in the next 20 years. These are not going to be the economic powerhouses of, of world growth as we go forward into the future. So it's, so really now is the time to, to work together to protect and nurture the huge youth population in the world. A, a very wise woman once told a US congressman, a woman will risk her life to have a baby that she really wants to have. And she will risk her life if she doesn't feel she can have a baby when she's, become, when she's pregnant. This has always been true. This will always be true. So in, in countries and settings, where abortion is highly restricted, and now we're talking about even, like I'm gonna say Texas, not just the developing world, um, will women have unwanted children? Probably some will, and probably some will have unsafe abortion. Two weeks ago, I was in um, the area near Kisumu, Kenya, which is in near Lake Victoria, Kenya, 
And I went to the clinic of a local midwife who I respect highly. When I arrived, she was taking care of a woman who had had sticks inserted into her cervix, probably blindly based on the lacerations of her cervix. She had pus coming from her cervix. Her abdomen was distended. She probably either had sepsis or perforation. She was taken to the local hospital, and, and our field representative let me know a few days later that she died in the hospital. The next provider I went to see about 10 kilometers down the road was taking care of a woman who was hemorrhaging from um, some method of attempted unsafe abortion. So, and this is a country that now has laws that do have legal indications for abortion. So, the, the, this, what we knew, need to do to, to really protect women is, first of all, to make highly effective contraception available because that is the best, the easiest, the most preventative method of saving women's lives from the dangers of, of unwanted pregnancy. And then, and secondly, to provide, to give information to providers, men and women, and to eliminate cost barriers to effective contraception, safe abortion, reproductive health care. And as some of the work Diana Foster Green has done in California, this is incredibly, an incredibly cost effective environment. So women need control of their fertility and their destiny. They need to give birth safely to children who are wanted and who have a chance to fulfill their potential and to contribute to a better world today, tomorrow, and this has a ripple effect way into the future. So with that, I'm going to give my presentation, which I'm not sure how to get into this. Oh, okay, and then this is my advance. Okay, so this is a long title, but basically we, are, we started a pilot project in Kenya and South Africa in 2012 to support providers to increase the quantity and quality of safe abortion and to increase post-abortion long-acting reversible contraception. So we, we trained field representatives in the private, to work in the private sector in Kenya and five uh, public sector uh, areas in five South African provinces. They collect data, an intense amount of granular data on tablet computers and as um, the UCSD team knows we have data for each provider that's 300 columns long. So we're collecting granular data about each provider, their practice, their setting, who trained them, and each case they provide and the contraception that each woman receives. This de-identified patient data um, about patient care and contraception are uploaded to a secure site and retrieved for validation, reporting, and analysis. And these are our field reps in Kenya. I couldn't fit everybody's photo on there, but um, I would say the one, one factor that they have that's a common thread is they have a really, really high emotional intelligence. Their job is to visit each provider on their route m once a month and to really get to know each provider, to understand their unique setting, their unique barriers, the challenges they face, and these people are problem solvers, they're mentors, they're connectors, and it's a very idiosyncratic and individualized approach to help providers improve. So um, this is a photograph of a um, training of levonorgestrel intrauterine contraceptive systems that we, we've done for these trainings in Kenya and we're getting the product um, into South Africa to do trainings there. If we find a provider who has been trained to insert LARC, but it's rusty, we'll arrange a refresher course. I'm just giving you an example of some of the interventions. There are really many of them, but um, we talked earlier in an earlier session, there was discussion about the myths that providers, and of course, women and men themselves have about um, <clears throat> contraception impairing future fertility of adolescents? Are IUDs a good method for adolescents? Um, do contraception, does contraception cause permanent harm? Can contraception, especially LARC, be inserted immediately after first trimester abortion? 
and I put together a little scientific, you know, and kind of visual, easy to understand uh, packet for each of the reps to share with their providers. And just as an example, one provider after the rep reviewed this, you know, simple resource with her, she went from providing no method of contraception, 70 to 75% of her patients, to providing LARC to 79% of her patients immediately post-abortion. So some information, um, some emotional intelligence, support, um, just encouraging these people, especially in Kenya, um, abortion was so recently criminalized, some of the local police don't even understand what the new constitution is, what the new Bill of Rights is, and our providers are supporting them to, hey, go to court, stand up to the police. The judge is going to issue you a certificate, and you can pin that on your wall. You will never have to put up with police in harassment again. And as I said just a few weeks ago, I can't read what that says. Is that one? OK. Um, a very dignified, tall clinician sort of looked out at the horizon, but also was looking into himself. And he said, I, I'm feeling brave and focused. And like, wow, what, what a reward in itself. So this shows in the first half of 2013 that 56% um, um, of women were see, receiving short-acting methods of contraception. And that has stayed about the same in the second half of 2013 but you'll see that the women who received no method has dropped by about two thirds, and the women who have who are receiving LARC immediately post abortion has more than doubled. So um, we, you know, we feel that our model has great potential, and and we are relying on UCSD to help us do a formal analysis and evaluation of it. So thank you very much, and with that, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Um, who, let's see now, Janine, Janine, and somebody is working magic here on the podium, so you'll have your slides. 